All right, I'm tired of standing in the dark, so I turned on the light, and I'm tired of talking only to one camera, so here we go. Um, let's move on, though. So let's talk about the three little pigs. Now, I've never taught this in a video lecture before. Uh, typically, when I'm in the classroom, I break people into groups, get everybody into small groups, usually the podcast groups, and get them to say, you know, what is the story of the three little pigs? What can you remember of the three little pigs? Everybody knows the story, or they think they know the story, but what is the story of the three little pigs, really? And um, then people get in their little groups, and then someone shares, all right, here's someone brave enough to raise their hand and say, here's the story of the three little pigs. And invariably, there are people in the classroom that say, oh, no, no, no you left out this, or no, 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 that's not, that's not the story that I know. Or So people have lots of variations of the story of the three little pigs. It's a story that almost everybody hears when they're a child, usually from their parents or from a book, and there's lots of different variations or versions of the story. But here's the thing about myth. In, in some cases, the detail, most of the details don't really matter. What matters is the main thrust of the story. But in some cases, some of the details are super important, right? Some of the details matter a great deal. And if you change or leave out some of those details, then it changes the truth of the story. And typically when I ask people to get into small groups and tell the story of the three little pigs, invariably there, is so, uh, there are some details that are left out that significantly change the story. So what does everybody know about the three little pigs? Well, you know, you know, the three little pigs and they went out and they built houses. One of them built a house out of sticks and one of them built it out of straw and one of them built it out of bricks or stone and the big bad wolf came down and blew down the first two and then couldn't blow down the third and then that's most that that much pretty much everybody can remember but let's think but there's a bit more to the story so then you might ask okay well so then what is the lesson what is the truth of that story if that's all we have just those details then what is the truth of the story is the story I guess build your house out of bricks, but my house is built out of wood and seemed to do just fine. Is the story that hard work pays off? Is the story that, I don't know what the truth of the story is. There could be plenty. Maybe you can come up with some. But in this version of the story that I know, it begins with these three little pigs. Like, why are these three, who are these three little pigs? Where did they come from? Why are they suddenly building houses? How do they know each other? Well, in the um, version I'm familiar with, these three little pigs were living at home with mom and dad, living in, with, in their little, yeah, with mama pig and daddy pig. And then one day, you know, mama pig came, mama and daddy pig came and said, y'all got to get the hell out of here. I don't care where you go, but you can't stay here. Quick story. So this, uh, I have a cat named Jasmine. She had kittens on May 25th and three kittens and one of those kittens went to another home but then the other two we just i honestly fell in love with and couldn't really part with them couldn't give them up and i like to keep kittens together so they have a sibling i just think that they're very social animals and they like to play with each other and that kind of stuff so um so we kept two of the kittens and it was so sweet you know i mean jasmine is a great mama and she she's so sweet to them and they all cuddle and they you know curl up together and they're just you know they're a nice little family but about three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, Jasmine completely changed. She didn't change towards me or towards the kids or towards anybody except towards her two kittens. So she has these two kittens. One of them is just simply called T Tabby, although we also call her Tag Tiger a lot. So Tabby Tiger. Then the other one, we each have a different name for him. So he's called Ferret Face, Sparkles, Flurkin, Bannon. I call him Flurkin. Flurkin, if you're an Avengers fan, um, Nick Fury, you know, has a cut on his eye, wears an eye patch because he got scratched by a Flurkin that looked like a cat, but was actually a Flurkin. So anyway, Flurkin. Flurkin and Tabby. But Jasmine, Jasmine all of a sudden, just a few weeks ago, just turned on those two kittens. And now she won't, like, attack them or anything, but if they come near her, she hisses at them and she swats at them and she runs away from them and she basically tries she's trying to get rid of those cats right she's trying to get them out of here why because jasmine is pregnant again jasmine's gonna have halloween kittens i'm super excited about that even though it'll be super hard uh, not to keep them and i have too many cats already three is more than enough so we don't have to find homes for those kittens and you know what 2020 is kind of a rough year and i feel like you know a few more kittens in the world ain't gonna hurt anybody what's the point what does this have to do with anything the point is that, you know, when 
the reason Jasmine wants to get the kittens out is because she's having more kittens, right? And kittens, you need to have a safe environment. You don't want other kittens or cats sort of playing with them or disturbing them or eating their food or any of that kind of stuff. So Jasmine and I take care, we're kind of a team. We take care of the kittens whenever she has to go outside or, you know, go eat or something. I watch over the kittens when they're, when they're tiny babies. Yeah. Uh, you don't want other kittens around, or other cats around during that time. So anyway, Jasmine wants to get her kittens out. Similarly, the mama pig and daddy pig and the three little pig story, they wanted to get their kids out. It was like, it's time for you to leave. It is time for you to go off to college. It is time for you to leave mom and dad's house and go out and start building your own life, right? You're no longer a child. Now you're growing up. Get the hell out of my house and go start being independent, right? Go start building a house. And mom and dad pig give their three little pig babies some advice. And they say, you know, you should really build your house out of stone or bricks. It's going to take longer. It's a lot more work. But if you build a firm um, house like we have done, then you'll be safe and protected. And if you don't, then, you know, you'll be screwed. But then what happened? Well, the three little pigs went out. One little pig did exactly what mom and dad said. He went and he got some stones and some bricks and he built his house out of brick, but it took a long time. It was a lot of work. Meanwhile, first little pig, he was like, well, I could go and buy bricks and stone or I could just get some straw and, you know, a keg of beer and party it up, right? And just have everybody over to my place. So I'll use some, if I have some money left over, I'll get a PS4, you know, and we'll just party it up, have a good old time. And so that's what he did. And then the wolf came by and blew his house down and fucking ate him. Now, I know that that might not be the version of the story that you heard, but that's the version of the story that I learned. The wolf blew down the house and he ate the first little pig. Then he goes to the second house. This guy, yeah, used wood. You know that part of the story. Wolf blows down the house and he eats him. So already we've got some morals of the story even before we get to the end, right? Wolves are real Wolves will eat you. You need to protect yourself. Part of being an independent grown-up adult is learning how to keep yourself safe, right? And secure against bad guys, because bad guys are real. Then the wolf, feeling, you know, after he digested those first two little pigs, and he goes to the third little pig's house, the pig they've built out of stone and brick, and he tries to huff and puff and blow his house down, but he can't blow the house down. So then the wolf, being particularly wily and particularly smart, and as somebody who's, uh, I don't have any wolves around here, but I've certainly lost more than my share of chickens to fox and coyote, and they are wicked smart. So the wolf climbed up on the roof of the brick house and then went down the chimney. But this pig was not only, not only listened to mom and dad about building the brick house, but also was super smart. And he, you know, had a cauldron of water. He built a fire and put a big cauldron of water um, on top of the fire and heated it up. And when the wolf came down the chimney, it fell into the pot of boiling water and was cooked. And then the pig, ate the wolf for dinner. So what's the moral of the story? Well, another truth of this story is, you know, wolves are real and you're either the one who eats or you're the one who gets eaten, right? Sort of a dog eat dog world or a pig eat wolf kind of world. So that's the story. Details matter, right? If you leave out the part about the parents at the beginning, or if you leave out the part about the wolf eating the pigs and the pig eating the wolf, then all of a sudden the story has a different truth or a different meaning, right? So some of the details don't matter. It doesn't matter whether it was built out of straw or twigs or wood or whatever, right? It doesn't matter if the third house was built out of stone or bricks or Portland cement or concrete blocks or stucco, right? What matters, um, none of those kind of details don't matter, but some of the other details matter a great deal in terms of the meaning and truth of the myth. Now, sorry, the meaning and truth of the story, because it's not a myth. Why is it not a myth? You already know the answer to this, because it is not told in any particular time or occasion. Now, what, who is the story intended for? It's clearly not intended for children. I think the reason that so many of us have different versions of the story and, and 
missed those versions where the pigs are eaten and the pig eats the wolf is because that's not really an appropriate story for children. And we tell it as a children's story, even though it doesn't really seem to have any meaning or point. It's really a story for people who are like 18, 19, 20 years old, right? It's, a, it's intended for those people that are be, that are leaving their house for the first time. When parents tell this story, it's a way of saying, look, you're going out into the wilderness. You're going, you can't stay here. You got to get out of my house, right? Just like Jasmine does to her kittens. It's time for you to go away. But the world is a dangerous place. Wolves are real. There's a lot of danger. There's a lot of bad people out there. And you can protect yourself if you plan accordingly. And if you're out, if you're smarter than those bad guys, then you can protect yourself. And if you're not, then you're not going to last very long. So if this were the kind of story that we were to tell in a sort of ritualistic way or at a particular occasion, then the occasion would be when adolescents leave the house, when they move out of mom and dad's house and they, well, when they leave, when they go wherever they go, this is, would be a story, hey, let me tell you this myth, right? It would become a myth at that time. It doesn't have to be told annually, doesn't have to be told all the time, right? It could just be told once. But if that once is at a particular occasion that's sort of where the context matters and the context fits the truth of the story, then it would qualify as a myth. You know, other occasions when people might tell myths or particular stories are like at weddings or at funerals or um, at the birth of a child. These are all occasions that may not happen more than once in your life, but they are nevertheless occasions where certain myths are appropriate to be told. And so these stories that are told at those moments that convey that particular truth that is particularly apropos or particularly appropriate, particularly suited to that context, to that occasion, then that would certainly qualify as a myth. Again, just to emphasize, myth has nothing to do with whether or not the story is true or false. The story of the three little pigs is absolutely false, right? I know from experience that having pigs, pigs do not build houses at all, and pigs don't know the proper ratio of sand to Portland cement. So they can't mix the mortar, which is necessary in order to build a house out of bricks. Also, you know, just pigs are not allowed in Home Depot. So how could a pig even buy cement or bricks, right? Where would they get it? Would they have to like a, it doesn't even make sense, right? It's not a true story. Moving on. So as we learned in an earlier lecture, in order to define something, you have to be able to clearly circumscribe or define to make finite the boundaries of what that thing is. So give a clear definition. So I've done that. A, def, a myth is a story with a particular truth told at a particular occasion, um, event, time, etc. But it's also helpful to to articulate something that's outside of that description, right? The A inside the circle and then the not A, so that we know where the boundaries are. What is a myth and what is not a myth? So what I just gave you with the story of the three little pigs uh, is not a myth, right? The story of Harry Potter is something that could qualify as a myth, perhaps in my family, but probably not in most, most families. Because Now, what about Rosa Parks? So usually I get my class to sit in the circle, like I said, and after we do the three little pigs exercise, then I ask them, you know, what is the story of Rosa Parks? What details do you know? And usually there are some people who know, everybody knows the basic details. Rosa Parks was a black lady who sat down on a bus in a seat where she wasn't supposed to, and she broke the law. She broke the law and was arrested for it. Her arrest caused uh, an uproar and protest and everything, and the protest was so um, the protest was so fervent and, that it was successful. And then that law was changed, right? So she broke a law. Then everybody realized, hey, this law is unjust. So let's get rid of that law, right? So this is a basic story. Now there's other people might know more parts of the story you know rosa parks history and her history of protest her history of activism the sort of the details surrounding that episode and what rosa parks was like as a woman and what her father was like and his um that sort of there's plenty of details that we could add in but nevertheless those are enough details to get to the truth of the story which is that some laws are unjust 
And the only way to correct unjust laws is to violate them and protest against them, right? There needs to be the people can stand up against unjust laws in order to change them and to create a society that is more just than it was before those unjust laws were removed. And also maybe part of the story is that anybody could do this, right? Rosa Parks was, um, was a rather petite woman and certainly not strong or anything like that, but was brave, brave enough to stand up to the police, brave enough to stand up to the bus driver, brave enough to stand up to those who wanted to um, remove her and who did, in fact, arrest her. So it's a story, right? Story of Rosa Parks. And it certainly conveys a truth, right? That, that unjust laws need to be changed and we can change them by standing up and protesting against them, drawing attention to their, um, to the injustices of those laws, etc. And also that you don't need to be, you know, Hercules in order to change the law. You don't need to be rich and powerful in order to change the law. You just have to get people's attention and say, here is an injustice that needs to be corrected. But, is this story of Rosa Parks, is it a myth? Now, I know you're probably thinking, or most of you would think it before this lecture, absolutely not. Rosa Parks' story is true. How could you call it a myth if it's true? But remember, whether or not a story is true has no bearing on whether or not it's a myth. A myth can be true or untrue. The true or falseness of the myth is irrelevant to the truth of the myth, right? But what about that third criteria? Is this a story that is typically told at a particular occasion, a particular event, a particular time? Is it? Well, typically I ask my students uh, in the classroom, I know you can't respond to me now, but typically I ask my students, you know, when did you hear the Rosa Parks story? When were you told the Rosa Parks story? And they usually give me some answer like, oh, second grade or fourth grade or 10th grade or something. Uh, usually, at least some students will say, actually, I think I learned about it multiple times in you know, lots of different grades. Maybe the first time was second grade, but I've heard it lots of times since then. And I say, yeah, but when did you hear it? What time, when in second grade or fourth grade or 10th grade, when did you hear it? And they will all think back and they would say, you know, I think it was in February in Black History Month. So we have here a story, which is true. Well, at least some versions of it are true. We uh, have here a story which is told within our culture at a particular time in a ritualistic way each and every year, and we tell it not because of the history that it represents, but because of the truth we want to convey. It's also telling a history, right? It's also conveying that history, which is important to know. But more important is the truth which it is conveying, which is that there are unjust laws, and anybody can stand up to those laws. You don't have to be rich or powerful or strong or anything like that. You can stand up to unjust laws in a nonviolent way, just as Rosa Parks did, right? She stood up for the, against those laws by sitting down on the bus. So, is the story of Rosa Parks a myth? Yes, absolutely. If we're, if we're using that word myth in the way that we've defined it now as a story with a particular truth that is told at particular occasions, particularly, I keep using the word particularly, typically told at particular occasions, events, or times, especially if it is part of our culture. So we should maybe think about that word culture. Cult, um, a cult is something that is done. Cult again is, uh, I could have another lecture on cult, but cult is, a, is, is another technical term in religious studies, which means something very different outside of religious studies. Most people say cult when they mean occult or something like that. Yeah, they get a cult and occult confused. But regardless, that's, the word cult simply means something that is done on a regular basis, something that is done habitually, something that is done that is practiced frequently and broadly. So we could say, in this culture, they eat, you know, naan. In this culture, they eat a lot of rice. In this culture, they sing songs in pentatonic scale. In this culture, they wear hats, you know, or whatever. So the story of Rosa Parks is part of our 
culture, and it is part of our culture, particularly in that in the month of February, in this annual event, this annual time when we tell stories about our Black history in the United States, and they may not always be the same stories, but some of them will be the same. So certainly that Rosa Parks story is standard fare in Black History Month and something that everyone should know. So it certainly meets all of our criteria for myth, whereas the Three Little Pigs does not. And then the Harry Potter, like I said, might work for my family, but maybe isn't a myth for most other families. But the distinction is uh, Harry Potter, regardless of whether you're in my family or some other family, it is a story and it certainly conveys more than a few truths through those stories. But it's only a myth if it is told or recalled or celebrated uh, or revisited at certain occasions in a sort of cultic or cultural in cultural patterns. And in my family, it tends to be in December. Okay, right, so we'll take a quick mental break. I need one, you need one. I'm going to have a, a drink and a smoke probably, and then I'll see you back here in a few minutes to talk about Mercy Eliade and the Aranda tribe from Central Australia and their cosmogonic myths.